My name is Joanne Canning, and this is about winter vegetables. It's really one of my favorite subjects. Uh, and Cantor made a wonderful comment about this picture of this little sugar loaf chicory, um, because it looks like it's covered in sugar, and uh, it's it's a frost. So um, I know from looking at um, the roster here that we have a lot of experienced gardeners. So first of all, if I do repeat something, feel good about yourself that you already know you already know that and don't have to worry about it. You all have handouts. And so there are several slides that are going to repeat those handouts. And that's made for uh, people who are going to be looking at this later uh, on YouTube. And um, they will get that information as well. For the new gardeners, um, or at least people who are new to winter vegetable gardening, I'm going to be going over some basics quickly um, uh, because you know you guys will pick it up fast uh, and it will fill in a few holes. Um, I'm going to, uh, my lectures are usually an hour and a half. I'm going to try to stop early because this subject has a lot of questions and just uh, as Kendra said, put them in the chat box um, and we'll deal with as many as we can. So my job today um, is to give you an overview. Um, and one of the most important things is looking at your seed catalogs. Um, you can see all the varieties and the planting tables. Unfortunately, you look at it and it's like the early winter this and the late autumn that, and it gets very overwhelming and very confusing. So I'm gonna go about it step by step. Sometimes you'll have to be patient if it's a section you already know, but let's just sort it out. And this way you're really gonna be more assured um, that you're gonna be successful, particularly if this is your first serious endeavor into having a winter garden. Um, I'm gonna review the basics, as I said, and I'm gonna walk you through um, some definitions that people will find confusing so you can set them aside and how to work around them when you're using documents that seem to have conflicting terms. Um, then we're going to do a quick review of planting tables, how to use them. Um, we'll talk a bit more about seed catalogs and you'll actually, I'll actually give you a basic um, planting formula. Uh, so if you don't, if you find the planting calendar doesn't quite make sense, you can plug in this formula and find out, oh goodness, I should have planted that two weeks ago. Um, then we'll, then I'm going to walk through all the specifics on what you need to be successful, what to watch out for, um, and we'll finish up with some ideas on overwintering crops, and we'll look at the book list, um, which um, the Island University has a very good book list on this, and also I've uh, got a list of reliable websites. Um, uh, Master gardeners are always science-based and um, all these websites can guarantee that. So thank you very much for everyone being so patient. Um, um, this uh, is presented by the Vancouver Island uh, Master Gardeners and the Vancouver Library. Um, this page is our um, caveats page. Um, the images are all separately copyrighted. Um, we're thanking the uh, various groups and businesses um, for um, reproducing their images um, under the fair use laws uh, for an educational seminar. Um, the Master Gardeners um, is a science-based international organization of the specially trained teachers uh, who work in partnership with public agencies and private enterprise to promote sustainable horticulture. And none of this can be reproduced without permission. Um, as you see, um, there's a picture of a winter vegetable called um, monk's beard chicory, a very uh, popular Italian um, culinary choice. Um, now, why do we want a winter garden? Um, most people think um, 
it's so much more work. I've been gardening for seven, eight, nine months. I need to rest. And the thing is, is that winter gardening is not gardening. It's winter harvesting of food crops. And that a lot of people don't get because if you add the one small task of starting some new seeds and putting them in pots and planting them out um, at the time of year that you're putting the rest of your garden to bed anyway, um, you're actually, instead of only harvesting for seven to nine months, you're only working seven to nine months and you get to harvest for 12 months. And that's a very important thing. The other, the other thing to note about winter gardening is some of our most nutritious foods are our winter vegetables. And for many people, the winter garden is the garden because of where they live. So they might not produce tomatoes, but they sure as heck will produce kale and cabbage. Um, it um, also actually helps keep your garden healthier because you're paying attention to it. Uh, you may not be working in it, but say the wind has come up and um, it's blown some mulch off and the soil is bare. Well, you're out there um, picking your sprouting broccoli and you, you, you kick the mulch over and uh, you've protected the soil for winter, but we don't really think of it that way. Um, the, um, uh, the other important thing, one of the reasons that um, I say that it's the most nutritious group of vegetables we have is that there's lots of color. You'll see from this picture, that's a purple cabbage. Every time you have um, something that is not green, you're getting another um, group of um, vitamins and minerals. And the studies show that if I grow a green cabbage and a red cabbage, they both have the same basic nutrition, but the red cabbage will be higher in um, B12 vitamins, anthocyanins, the um, 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 immune booster vitamins. So um, you'll see um, in a lot of the winter garden vegetables, lots of color and uh, in carrots, you, you see the same thing. The other thing is that you have a lot of heritage vegetables the reason being that um, they're really good. If something isn't practical, people stop growing it. The best example are string beans. Now we have the pole beans that are the children of those old string beans. I cannot find an old fashioned spring be uh, string bean anymore. They've died out. They don't need them. They have better varieties. And yet we have some varieties in the garden that have been grown since the late 1700s. So that's another reason is that you have tough varieties that are very forgiving and very tough. And uh, in terms of, uh, well, tough, easy to grow. They're also cheaper. We all know how expensive things can get, um, how much cauliflower can get. Well, I'd rather pick a fresh cauliflower. And um, it's been proven that many vegetables, uh, I read a study on spinach, in 10 days of storage, spinach can lose up to 50% of its nutritional value. And it doesn't matter whether it's grown organically or the chemical feast, they both lose as much as 50%. So uh, when you're picking something fresh, of course it's tastier because it's more nutritious. Um, for me too, um, to step out in a winter garden and well, look at that uh, a picture of the chicory, to really experience it in winter and then you get to bring dinner inside, to me that's, that's worth it. Now let's look at um, the um, reasons that uh, I want to get to, there we go, um, how the gardens are different. Particularly if you've done the summer garden, um, it's you're not always sure of how it is different or why you have to do different things. And so let's the summer garden. Um, the further north you go, 
um, the more the winter garden becomes the main the main season garden because you just have a shorter growing season. And then one thing I learned in the desert is that there is a time that nothing grows because it's too hot. And as our climate change uh, um, is upon us, people are seeing that even in this climate more often. So we have warm, moist soil, strong sunlight. So we get the high yields in the optimum time frame, which is just what the seed packages say. Um, when you enrich your soil, you boost your crop once you wait about two uh, two weeks for the soil um, web and all the wonderful microbes and the worms to really break that down and make it available to the crops. You have a very long planting window. And when you succession plant, you get continuous harvests. And this is where the first aspect of winter gardens come in because you're able to plant for the late season, the autumn, the winter and the overwinter crops at that same time in the planting window. You have many cultivars that are good in containers and this allows you um, to fallow certain crops so you have more room for later on. And the close planting is okay because you've got rich soil that's constantly active. So the caveats are you have to protect the crops against sun scald or against heat days, more and more prevalent now than it used to be. Um, and you have to ensure adequate water when the plant needs it. So what about our winter garden? And here are winter French lettuces on the left. That's Merveille de Quatre Saisons. Write that down. It's a French heirloom winter lettuce that's been grown since the early 1800s. I made the mistake of spilling a bunch of seed uh, and it popped up everywhere. For three years, I had stuff popping up on in the lawn. I dig it up, put it in the garden. Um, most important thing, no planting. You've already done it. But a lot more caveats. And here's the, here's the one that's probably most important. The amendments you put in the summer garden, as I said, work. The amendments in the winter garden stop. So you have to have all those amendments ready to go and all your plants all plumped up and tough um, because the cold soil doesn't allow um, the plants to uptake very much food. They can uptake food if they're a hardy variety that stands just fine all winter. So you see the soil has to be 12, uh, 7 to 12 degrees, um, which is late March, early April. And what people do not understand often in our gardens is our soil is warmer in November than it is in April. Um, it's kind of interesting. That's why we can do those late crops. That's why we can uh, start our winter vegetables, grow them in gallon pots and transplant them in August and September. That's why we have winter plantings of garlic and fava beans because the soil is still active and then they go dormant. So they get that boost they're all ready to go. The other caveat is you have to protect the crops against wind and frost. For the hardy crop, it's mainly wind. We'll talk about that. You also have to protect them against too much water, which is why you kind of grow these big, big giant plants um, up on slight mounds uh, like you would a squash, only not quite as big. And you need more space per plant because the soil is offering less. It will offer the same, but you need more space because the plant can't grab it all quite as fast. And that means that the space in the garden needs to be reserved for early spring. So you have to go about um, your uh, planting map a little different, but we'll go over that. So next, this is something that confuses a lot of people and that's okay um, because once you realize that, then you um, won't be bothered by it. 
Now, this is my wonderful uh, borage, which um, I let self sow in the garden because the little leaves um, taste like cucumber and they're wonderful to add to salads. And in, uh, of course, the, the flowers are edible. And in summer, you can pick those leaves, drop them into ice water, and you get this cucumber flavored ice water. It's quite lovely. So the seasons of the of winter gardening um, really refer to the harvest times. So autumn to winter is October to November. Early winter is December to January. Hungry Gap, and we'll specifically deal with those because we got a, long, a lot of Hungry Gap foods, are February to March. And then early spring is March to April. That's when we have overwinter um, vegetables. That's when we have the earlier ones maturing. And this, as I've made the note, you see some catalogs call late winter very early or early spring very early. So it's confusing. Um, the overwinter crops are usually harvested in March and April before planting your greens, um, although you can also leave that little section fallow. I really went to more uh, planting in squares, um, not the square foot gardening, but more like the square yard gardening, because it was easier to go fallow that way and um, not have great long rows that uh, had to be fallow. So, um, when you are dealing with when to plant and when to harvest, um, that's what you um, that's what you are concerned with. So let's move right on to keys um, for success. Um, that uh, picture in the background is a corn salad wonderful and hearty. Um, you reach down and you pinch the center out with your with your fingers and um, the uh, center grows again, grows all winter. It's kind of a cross between, goodness, what? Spinach and um, uh, spinach with a little bit of pepper on it. I love them, very succulent. So here's our keys to success. And as you can see, this is the Russian red kale. Um, the flat leaf kale has always been my favorite because it's reliable, it's winter hardy, and it doesn't collect aphid the way the curly ones do. Everyone has their favorite cultivar. That happens to be mine. Now, here we are. If you're new to winter gardening, very important. Choose a very few cultivars, different ones, and very few plants. Or if you want to experiment, I'm only going to grow cauliflower and broccoli. Try two or three different varieties. Or I'm only going to grow cabbages. Try an early winter cabbage, an overwinter cabbage. Just keep it simple. Don't overdo it. And make this a learning time. And all of a sudden, it's like pruning. All of a sudden, the penny will drop and it'll stay in your head. But keep make a map so you know what you know where and what you planted last time. Doesn't have to be grand. Most people can't read mine, but I know what they mean. The other thing you need to do is enrich the soil. You have to do that in autumn, but you're doing it anyway when you're mulching and putting the bed together, so don't worry about it. This is key. Know your planting windows. We're going to go about that. Start at the beginning of your planting window or don't bother for this year. It's all right. There's either a later variety you can grow or you can try something else. If you don't start on time, you really risk losing the plant because um, winter is not kind. And here, match cultivars to the harvest season, which is kind of like starting early. Um, we're going to go through all these in depth, plant different varieties. I just talked about this at the same cultivar or plant different cultivars for different har harvest windows. Um, the example is Calabrese or sprouting broccoli. Calabrese is your main head broccoli. Many of the newer varieties will give you some side shoots, but it is not winter hardy. Sprouting broccoli loves the cold. Many of our winter garden, um, uh, winter veggies were developed in climates further north than ours and further inland than ours. And so they're very happy here. Make room, as I had said before, give them plenty of room. 
which means you plant fewer plants because crowding will, you'll just get plants that'll die. Protect your half hardy. We'll talk about that. And then we're going to deal right at the end um, with a term called winter sowing. It's kind of fun. Um, some of us already do that. We just don't give it that fancy name. Now in your handouts, um, I really like the sewing calendar from whentoplant.com because it, it shows when you plant, when it's going to grow, and then when to harvest. And so you really get a sense of how things can overlap. And this one is from West Coast Seeds, um, probably one of the best um, that you can get because it's local. And I'm going to show you a picture of it. Um, you can see that this is the main one for this year. They put out a second one called um, the winter um, planting. And it's nice. But they've chosen certain varieties. Many of them are not in this major one. And the instructions on how to plant and how to grow out are all in your main guide. If you don't have a paper one, you can read it online. Um, I've talked to many old gardeners. Um, I'm one of them. And one of the main ways that I learned about vegetables was I read the catalogs all winter. So here we have the formula. So if you don't have um, a calendar, um, the thing you need to know is your frost date. I just remembered that one thing that I forgot to do was to put down this website. Grab a pen, quick, 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 quick. And it's easy to remember. It's called Weather Spark. And Weather Spark, and then put in your city. It is a complete climate analysis of your city. It will tell you, it will show the tables of the rain patterns, um, the exact number of days that you can grow vegetables, when your first frost is. It, they're quite fascinating. Um, uh, we use those tables uh, when we teach um, the new master gardeners. Now, for hardy crops, you ask these questions. When do I want to harvest? Um, do I want January, February? Do I want to go November through February? Do I only want hungry gap plants that don't even harvest until then? All those things. Go to your seed uh, catalog. They'll give you all those options. How many days to harvest? Now that's from the seed packet. Now you have to add the number of days to transplanting. So you look at your seed package, you say, oh, I'm going to sprout in X number of days. One of the uh, things about winter vegetables is they're often very slow to sprout. People who have grown Swiss chard understand that. Wonderful, wonderful crop, biennial crop that you can trick into being perennial. I've grown mine for about three years in containers, and then they get a little bit woody. So I, as a matter of fact, I just sent my... Um, my chard to uh, the big compost bin in the sky and we're growing out new babies. Um, so you have your days of harvest, you have plus the days that it takes from seeding to transplant. That's in your catalog. They'll tell you when to transplant them. The rule of thumb is make sure it has roots, good roots. And if that means the plant has to be a bit bigger, let it grow another couple of weeks. And they need to be probably a minimum of three to four inches tall. Then you add your winter slowdown. In other words, I got to back up another two weeks. That gives you your planting window, which is a number of days. And what you'll discover is that that number of days is maybe three weeks from mid-August to early September. It might be 60 days. Um, it, uh, it might start and stop again, like what cabbages will really teach you a lot. 
Um, so you count back from the time you want to harvest to when you need to plant it. Now in frost tender crops, that means that you need to plant that crop out before the frost date and you do, you, you work backward from that point. And that's your planting window. And if you're using cloches and, and uh, you cover the crop, cover, cover the ground, I've got crops, which is incorrect. Cover the ground a week before that frost date. It will keep the soil warm. You can put your plants in the soil, put your polytunnel on top of that. Generally though, you can uh, simply follow the calendar. So here's our first thing about success. Start early for slow growers. These funny little patio um, greenhouses, um, when the first one I bought, I think was $35. I ended up with, I think, four of them. And um, they became a year round friend. Um, you can see this fence behind it. And all I did was tie it on the fence. This is in August. You can see some of my brassicas um, all, um, getting big and plump. Um, these are the later brassicas in the middle um, that are in the smaller pots. Um, you can see I've potted up my bigger guys. And here's a picture of um, an old front walkway in our old place. And you can see in October, I've got my dahlia and my kale. I just found that it makes a, a lovely um, thing to see along the, uh, along the walkway. And then it was easy to pick as well. Um, now, the next thing is know your cultivars. And again, the catalog, are they hardy? Are they completely tender that I have to grow in a, in a greenhouse or are they half hardy? They um, will sit out with some, with, with some cover. And which window does that cultivar fit? Um, and what kind of harvest do I want? Some are all at once, like a garlic bulb. Some are cut and regrow, which are lettuces or chicories or spinach. Um, others, um, you pick the leaves or the stalks to thin them, like uh, kale. Uh, Dr. Linda Gilkison did a study um, in harvesting winter crops. Thank you, Dr. Gilkison. She was um, my first entomology teacher. Um, entomology is, a, as you all know, a study of insects. Uh, she tried two methods of harvesting and then she weighed the difference in the harvests at the end of the year. By picking um, only two or three leaves from her kale plants or only up to 30% um, of the leaf cover, um, she harvested four times as much per plant. Well, when you're thinking of feeding a family of four and you get four times as much from one plant, that's, that's pretty cost effective. I've also had clients come to me and said, I thought that kale was hardy and mine have all frozen and, uh, and they've all died and rotted. And I said, how did you pick it? Well, they stripped the whole plant. And I said, yep, nothing to keep it alive. But if you alternate your leaves all the way up and key here, never pick the top. Always leave that to grow. It grows very, very slowly, but it still grows. Now here on the right are little, little uh, Ford Hook giant chards. Um, and that, that beautiful um, kale is ornamental. But ornamental kale are also edible. So they make a beautiful flower in autumn. They sprout up and on that stalk are little leaves that are succulent and look, look great with, uh, with lettuces. Shred an apple into that kale, that chopped kale, even the big leaves. Oh, such a salad. And here in one of my little greenhouses is, is my, uh, my marjoram. It, uh, I, where I grew it, it wasn't fully hardy. So I grew it in a pot and left it in the unheated mini greenhouse. On the left um, is another group of lettuces that I grew that um, were really tender. 
So I would overplant them in the pot and then I would just pull them up and thin them. Uh, and of course, in the upper left is spinach. And you see down below, that's actually kohlrabi that I um, planted in a, in a big planter and then planted it out later. Um, here's a group of plants that uh, are a really nice addition to the garden because um, they, as I say in the bottom, they uh, give you um, a real variety. They're also like cabbages, if you're into stir fries, another group that is great to learn on because they go from completely hardy, which is the um, tatsui on the bottom left. Um, bok choy is um, a toss up. For some, uh, some people, they say it's totally hardy. Others um, don't experience that. Um, and that was my experience, um, was that uh, they were fine unless the wind hit them. So I learned to plant all my really heavy duty crops in a square around them, plop my chard and my bok choy right in the middle where they wouldn't be so affected. Um, the uh, big mustard greens, uh, you also see those um, in European varieties as well as Asian varieties. And on the table to me, um, they're approximately the same, but you see the colors. And over here uh, on the far left is, is uh, Mizuna. Um, that is comes in lots of varieties and some lovely variegated colors. And then you've got, um, uh, I I'm not sure of the one next to Mizuna, um, but you can see again, some small mustard greens. So they're a good, uh, a good group to learn on. Uh, and as I say, you like stir flies, they're perfect. Now, here is um, another term that uh, Dr. Uh, Gilkison uses in one of her wonderful books on winter gardening, and that is um, the living fridge. I wanted to show you what my living fridge over the years ended up looking like. And you can see in a four and in five, um, it kind of looks like the summer garden. Um, I, uh, um, I have parsley, uh, one, two is that wonderful, um, French lettuce. Um, as you can see, it's frozen. That was February. And there's the key. If something is frozen, leave it alone. It'll thaw. Um, then, it, uh, you have the corn salad, which some people call vit. Um, and, um, in the bed, you can see, uh, smack dab in the middle, um, you can see the uh, chicory, big, generous plants. You can see the red um, lettuces. Um, and under the netting, um, I've got um, carrots and cauliflower. Um, it, that netting keeps the um, deer away. And um, then uh, in early, early spring, that's finished. And I throw my polytunnel over that. Um, and I, I will plant very, very early um, crops. Um, you, the onions are at the back, so it's kind of hard to see. Um, of course, you can't see the carrots. Um, up here on the bottom left, that's my winter broccolis and my Brussels sprouts and my kale. You see, they're big plants. They are up to your hip. So that's, that's at least three feet. And later on in the summer, my kale, well, not summer, later on in the spring, I have pictures of my kale. I would save two or three plants. Um, they would be six feet tall, all in flower and all those tiny little leaves, sweet, sweet um, salad greens, which means that I didn't have to plant more. All the flowers are yellow and peppery and edible. Um, you see the collards under the snow. Now here, I had some um, uh, Danish ball heads. I wanted small cabbages. And with cabbages, you can stump them by crowding them. And that's, I deliberately did that. Um, so I could um, have some small cabbages because the far right one, number eight, is my 25 pound January King cabbage. And I only grew two of those a year because they needed at least 
three feet square around them. They grew huge and I used them for making sauerkraut and by picking the leaves off the outer side, you don't cut them, you um, harvest outside leaves. Um, you can make cabbage rolls because they're big leaves and they roll up. And then you can also store that big plant on, a, on your porch. Uh, and the outer leaves will get dry and it actually preserves the cabbage. Um, now here's another example of the living fridge. Very few of these pictures are mine um, because I didn't take pictures of um, roots. <laughs> um, so you have leeks, uh, the kohlrabi. Now the kohlrabi is actually not a root, which is why you'll see it poking up on the ground and then the swell at the top. Um, that crown of a plant um, is where everything starts. That's the seed. It's the stem cells. And the, the kohlrabi was developed uh, in a part of Europe that had terrible wireworm infestations and, would, and um, club root that would just do in the brassicas that are such an important group of food plants. And so they developed kohlrabi um, from the, what they called the meristem, the undifferentiated cells um, at the base of the plant. And that's why you have um, the leaves growing out of the swelling um, and why you have that succulent um, bit of um, uh, plant inside. Um, uh, but they, they kind of act like a root, but I wanted to show you that because they're one of the few brassicas that is neither fish nor fowl. Um, we have the beets. Um, many of them uh, developed for tops as well as um, roots or, or bulbs. Um, and again, you have uh, something called Hamburg or parsley root. Um, it tastes like a cross, well, the parsley and carrot, they're the uh, same family. So you have, if you don't like strong carrots, um, parsley root uh, tastes like the cross between parsley and carrot with a hint of parsnip thrown in there. And so I got green tops uh, during winter as well as my roots. So that saved me space. Um, on the left, um, those are all winter radishes. I love that picture. Um, it really shows you the variety. And some of them are very, very spicy. Um, some of them are quite mild, um, but those are winter radishes. Um, and on the right, um, we have turnips and rutabagas, which some people think are the same, and they're not. Uh, turnips are uh, first recorded in the 1300s as a vegetable. The rutabaga was not developed until the late, 17, late 1700s, 1700s, um, uh, when there was a rather warm patch in the world. And um, the um, agricultural revolution, which preceded, of course, the industrial revolution, um, developed a lot of new plants. The rutabaga is actually a cross between a turnip and a cabbage. Uh, and it was made for the northern gardens in Scandinavia to give them a root vegetable that they could grow. Um, look at all the carrot varieties here. I'm going to um, talk a moment about the red ones. Uh, some of them are red all the way through. S my favorite was um, the dragon carrot and the purple haze because they were red on the outside, orange on the inside, and they did not taste, oh, they were kind of woody and boring when you pulled them uh, to eat them raw. Um, the carrots that are uh, were good raw, the winter carrots are, are all your um, orange ones. I found the white ones a little bit too bland, um, but everybody has different flavors uh, in their head. These red ones, first of all, not only higher in nutrition, but when you cook them, they just sing. Um, the amazing difference they make to stews or as a steamed vegetable, quite remarkable. Of course, you have your parsnips, and um, this overwinter onion, this is the Walla Walla that I used to grow, and celeriac, which is a root um, and it tastes like celery. Here we have the hungry gap harvest. There are some plants that are meant only for the hungry gap. 
uh, and um, they are February to, Ma to March. Now, the hungry gap um, is a European term. It is the time in which the larder runs out and the new stuff hasn't grown yet. And it's usually February to March. It's what your relatives in Ontario call the brown time. And there are, there are vegetables deliberately developed to harvest during that time. So there's the celeriac and the um, one of the, uh, I have two chicories on the bottom left is the monk's beard. And this I just photographed um, this past year. That's my ornamental uh, kale beginning to shoot up when we had that snow and um, all those lovely white um, uh, um, leaves are succulent and edible. This is Brussels sprouts. If it's a hot summer, you don't do well with Brussels sprouts. So if you decide to grow Brussels sprouts, you keep them in the shade and um, you harvest them um, in three different, uh, three different ways. And that's the neat thing about some of your hunger gap foods is that you often get more than one harvest. With Brussels sprouts, they grow up the stem. You harvest the bottom half first leave the top half, you'll find they're smaller, aren't they? But once you harvest the bottom half, the top half take off, then they become plump and you can see them on this one. This one I think is Gustus that I grew. Then you have the top group and you'll find that after you've harvested the last of your Brussels sprouts, during the hungry gap at the end of it, more like March, that top, because it's um, a biannual and you've tricked it um, with uh, producing part of it early and then overwintering, and now it wants to flower. It produces at the top of the stem, something that looks like a loose cabbage. You grab it, you twist it slightly and pop it off carefully. And you have a beautiful, sweet, cabbagey leaf. A little bit coarse for a salad unless you're going to julienne it and and use say an apple or a strong dressing to break it down a little. Then you get a third crop. All around the edge of where you popped it up you have tiny little Brussels sprouts growing and you get a third crop of those. Uh, one plant. So that's one plant. Um, and uh, uh, again, uh, you can see the uh, purple sprouting broccoli. The key with that one, again, don't cut the top one. Start from the bottom, pick them, and then they get successively smaller, but they stay sweet. And here is a Hungry Gap uh, dinner. Um, you can see my overwintering onions and my broccoli, and uh, their sprouts from... Um, uh, a cabbage um, right in the middle sticking up there. Um, that's all very succulent and sweet. You can see um, one of my uh, dwarf uh, cabbages that was only about, um, I think three to five pounds. In the upper right um, is chocolate mint, which was my favorite type of mint that would always overwinter in a pot and give me um, lovely uh, tea. There's my winter lettuce. And in the bottom is a purple cabbage or a, a purple cauliflower. From there, the last season we have is early spring. Um, you can see on the upper left, that's my six foot um, kale. Hummingbird, uh, it's a little rufous hummingbird going, going crazy um, on the blossoms, which are edible. Now I can start cutting the tops. I can cut these succulent tops up. I can stir fry them. I can julienne them into salads. The blossoms are peppery. Here's what a sugarloaf chicory looks like. Um, now it's headed up. I cut it at the base. I trim off all those old dead leaves and I have this base left. If it's a rainy spring, I take, I take the bottom leaves and I fold them over top to make an umbrella, take a little stick and thread it through. Something my mother uh, showed me for chicory and also for uh, cauliflower, if they're starting to shoot up by covering the head, you keep the sun off 
and the heads stay tight. And then that chicory um, just split in half and either roasted or steamed. On the right, um, here are my overwintering onions and you see next to them, that's the um, corn salad that has stood all winter. Bottom left is just a, a shot of the kale from far away with uh, on the lower left, um, the last of my um, purple sprouting broccoli. And here is my favorite Brussels sprouts. You can really see the head on that um, making your little cabbage. Uh, and that is red ball. Uh, I found it much more tasty than either Gusta's or Long Island improved. And here is um, a small harvest. Uh, that's dinner with spinach and um, uh, chicory and um, some early dill that I um, uh, uh, grew. No, I'm sorry, that's bronze fennel um, that I grew in my little greenhouse and some uh, small um, kale leaves. So there was salad and um, uh, steamed greens. Now, um, you need to um, look at your half hardy plants for a couple of reasons. Um, you can speed up your harvest if you put hardy plants under cover. So you can uh, say plant a, um, a, a patch of mustard greens. You cover them up. It, yes, it protects it from the snow and whatnot, but they grow faster and you harvest them sooner and then the stuff that isn't under cover is simply slow. So you can extend your harvest in one planting. Um, the, um, I have, I uh, used to always do half hardy lettuces because I had um, my hardy lettuces and I relied on that French butterhead lettuce and um, Amish deer tongue, not deer tongue, Amish deer tongue, very, very old variety. Um, and um, like the cost lettuce um, or the romaine, they have a rib and they hold themselves up off the ground. So they're not as susceptible to critters getting inside. And when you look at the nutritional value, um, the ribbed lettuces or the lettuce with the core, which um, sometimes your butterheads have, all register as having protein. Not a lot, but a little. So both the Kos and the Romaine. The difference is the size. Kos, um, they were originally grown by the Romans. Romaine, da, okay, from the area around Rome. And they're big. Kos was grown from an area around Kos, and they're small. That's the difference, the only difference between them. You now will get uh, in some of the English catalogs, they'll, they'll say cost lettuce. Now, um, I think one variety they call little gem. It's just a cost, not going to get big. You don't always want a giant lettuce. So the hardy crops that I would grow um, would be um, the wild arugulas, um, not what we used to call the wild arugula, which is a perennial and I always found too woody, um, but one called Sylvat uh, Sylvatica. That's a very, very old Italian variety that I would plant in autumn. Um, I would plant um, maybe a six foot row or a six foot square. And I would have maybe a dozen plants. I'd get a good um, uh, early, uh, early winter harvest. Uh, I'm sorry, it would be um, September, October, and then in November, they would kind of stop and I would thin them all and I would leave three plants. They would overwinter and then they would sprout in spring and I would get three foot high arugula plants that like the kale, I would simply pick the leaves off. Again, chard, um, I found that um, they need protection from the wind. If you're gonna grow your spinaches, the older varieties that have got a slight stem and a rounder leaf, um, in some gardens, they can stand out all winter. I think you're smart if you put them under polytunnels um, and they are hardier. And you can see my, um, uh, this is a very homely picture in January uh, and all my potted 
um, things up against my fence. Um, come early spring, I pulled out my seeding mats, closed up my doors, and just seeded my plants out there. Um, now, here we have gardening for snowbirds. Um, you, can, you can plant in summer and autumn, like your garlic, garlic scapes. Um, some of your, um, if you plant your kale or plant out your kale late, um, it will just stand in the garden. And um, uh, slow growers like your leeks, um, overwintering onions like your uh, um, walla wallas, your fava beans, all those are planted in late autumn. Then what do you do? You go to Mexico and you wait to come back. It's all ready for you. There it is. Um, we discovered this very simple fact um, uh, in a community garden. Um, and it was actually um, a private enterprise that owns the ground. And uh, because there were commercial um, buildings and whatnot on the ground, they closed it. They closed the community garden for three months in winter. and. So people couldn't access their food. So everybody grew either Hungry Gap food and harvested it at the end of the Hungry Gap or they grew over winter crops. And when they opened up the garden, they were ready. Um, down on the upper right is actually a self-seeded um, lettuce. That beautiful uh, French lettuce with its full butter head and it self-seeded itself down in the corner of the rocks and popped up in between my chard. Now the term winter sowing, as I said, um, go to Mexico. Um, these are all hearty crops. Um, this is from Fairfax County Master Gardeners. And um, I forget what state that's in, but as you can see, they've used jugs and uh, clamshells and all sorts of things, they've planted hardy seeds in enclosures. And mother nature knows they're hardy. They've stayed dormant until this, the soil and the air and everything is perfect and they sprout. You don't have to do a thing. You come back and they're ready. And the thing about winter, the winter sowing is um, you don't have to tend to them and they're ready at the absolute optimal time for you to transplant. Mother nature knows better than you do and just let her do her thing. And again, um, this is good for alliums like your leeks, very, very slow growers. So you can plant them and then you can let them slowly grow and plant them out earlier, you get earlier leeks. Spring greens, Asian greens, all sorts of things. Again, refer to your catalog. So here's some tips and tricks that we'll finish up with. Um, things that I have learned along the, the, um, uh, the road and um, things that I've been taught along the road. One of the most important things for the winter garden is wind breaks. If you, if you um, take two thermometers, Put one, uh, um, hang one three feet ab uh, above the ground and put one at ground level, you will find that when the wind blows, the ground level is up to three degrees colder. You may not think much of that, but if the one at three feet is um, two, two degrees above freezing, then the one at ground level is frozen. And um, I, as you can see, uh, and I've mentioned this, I would put those big old heavy plants around um, where the, on the windward side, where the wind was coming from, and they would protect my chard and my bok choy. Other years, I actually planted them in a square around it. Um, I would use um, bits of pruning and old garden stakes, and I would also uh, sometimes roll up my old bird netting and just stake it. Anything to just break the wind coming across the ground. It was amazing. I, and I tested it. Uh, bok choy, big, those big succulent bok choy behind the netting, 
And so not even all the wind was stopped and outside of the netting. One group froze, the other ones didn't. Makes a big difference when you got to eat your crop. Um, I mentioned this about the polytunnels before. Um, and this again, I mentioned before um, about harvesting two or three leaves at a time. So, so instead of having, you know, three kale plants, you have five kale plants. Um, plant a couple in your garden bed, in your, in your flower bed, the way I did. And then I don't use up all the room. Here's the one pest we have for winter. It's the carrot rust fly. There's a lot of it in our area. And um, cover your carrots. Uh, they are active um, on warm days until Christmas sometimes, depending on your autumn. And so you go to pull up a carrot and all you got's a head. So, or all you got's the greens. So keep the carrots covered. Um, of course, polytunnels or netting, you can see in that picture that I showed you, keeps out deers and rabbits. Also, I found it quite effective for uh, um, foraging raccoons. They're not really after the greens, they're after the grubs and the slugs and the worms and whatnot that seek shelter under your plants. Again, I've mentioned this, harvest Brussels sprouts from the bottom up. Um, and then for protecting all your plants, you're going to be um, mulching for autumn. You're breaking your autumn or you're breaking your garden down for autumn. You're putting the last of your compost out. You're digging things in. Some people grow cover crops. I used to, but I found that um, because I had a really good source of horse manure, I would use leaves and horse manure and compost and I would prep the whole garden um, as I put it to bed. And um, then I would take whatever summer plants I had and I would simply chop and drop, leave them on the ground, cover them with the mulch. And I had my whole bed prepped, not only for the winter plants, but for the next spring. And if I had an area of fallow, that was prepped. So um, uh, when you're doing that, you want to keep this small donut of space. And I mean just um, two inches, just so it doesn't touch the plant stalks. Um, and um, that way, when the when, in spring, when the pill bugs migrate in, because they are very important composters and they eat all the woody stuff, they're not going to continue on and eat the stalks. Also, it keeps slugs slightly away. You can also put uh, collars around those plants as they come up to keep the slugs away. And then as they grow up, the leaves hang up rather than touch the soil because big leaves touching soil is just a slug highway, just a bug ladder. And um, that collar of just, um, uh, I used to use uh, 500 uh, milligram um, cottage cheese containers or yogurt containers and then let the plant grow up through it. Um, it protected the plant from the wind it created this little bucket of warmth in there for them because the plant does generate heat and you can pile up your mulch around it. Uh, I saved uh, many a uh, rosemary plant, which are actually one of our most uh, tender perennial herbs by doing that. Um, so here's another thing. When you're all mulched and ready to go, wait for a warm day and go out and do a couple of hours of pest patrol. Um, because you get them now, um, they won't be alive in spring. Um, lift up boards that you usually use to walk on. Don't leave them on the ground. Um, that is winter homes for pests, particularly slugs. And um, when you begin um, your hungry gap harvest in February, that's your, your cauliflowers, your later um, cabbages, um, your Brussels sprouts, but really the key plant is when you start to harvest your sprouting broccoli. Cut up some potatoes in thick slices, stick them in the ground around your plants. The wireworms are waking up early 
they will go to those potatoes. Particularly important around your lettuces. You'll find, you'll go out in the morning, you'll find a lettuce leaf, flat dead. If you reach down carefully, pick up that lettuce out of the ground in your hand so you don't, you don't destroy too many roots. You'll see there he is sticking into the stem of the lettuce. You can pull him out, replant your lettuce. You'll lose 50 of them, 50% 50 of them. Well, half a crop of lettuce is better than none. But by planting those um, potato traps around your plants, um, all you do is you go out and pick up a piece of potato and, and uh, get your, your worms then. Um, so here we are at the end, um, some books and websites. Um, this is from CBC, isn't that kind of neat? With uh, the whole stock of, uh, of Brussels and you can see your rutabagas and your beets and that big old ug ugly pupper, puppy up in the upper left, that's a celeriac root and some onions and that looks like um, collards and curly kale. And lying down is uh, some leeks. So a wonderful winter harvest. Um, I've um, listed all these uh, books that um, April, uh, our um, head librarian for our project um, and Kendra um, gave us that are in the garden. And they pretty much covered the ones that I would also recommend. And I've given you um, the blurb on them. The, this is also in your handout. Now, these ones are in your handout. And um, again, it will tell you all about them. There's a really, really neat one. The very first one called Garden, Garden Focused. It's, an on, it's from Britain, but um, it's an on-screen interactive planting calendar. So when you get to that page, hit specials and the menu will come up and it'll tell you uh, the two cities they use are Nanaimo and Victoria. So then you go, I want to plant this plant or I want to grow this plant and it will pop up with, a, with your own specialized planting calendar. I thought that was kind of fun. Um, there are um, several different seed companies um, because some of them are very, very good, but don't have a big variety. So do read this list. I encourage you to um, uh, try them all. And um, it's Virginia, Fairfax County, Virginia with the winter sowing. They have a great explanation of how to do it. So there we are. Um, and um, there's me and my favorite cabbage. Um, so let's look at our chat. Um, looks like we have a few questions. Yes, um, we have, yeah, we have a few questions there, uh, Joanne, and I have uh, one here that was sent to me privately, so. Okay, we, go ahead, let's start with oh. yours, Kendra. Okay, so someone just asked for a few more tips on, on Brussels sprouts, uh, besides harvesting from the bottom, and um, and that they that you harvest during the hun hungry gap. When exactly do you plant them, and do you have a tip for a best cultivar? Um, I can only give you a tip for my favorite cultivar, and that was the big red one, which was Red Ball. I found it the most reliable, and um, the most forgiving, if you will. Okay. Um, the other one, I grew Gustus, which you saw that picture, and I was, it, it wasn't as successful for me. Um, I like the Long Island improved better. Now, saying that, that was my experience. Other people are different. And the key with Brussels sprouts is that they do not like the heat. And they are long growers. I think you may have a bit of the growing sea or the planting season less. I'm just taking a quick look here. Um, Brussels sprouts. Um, you see, you really have missed your Brussels sprout um, 
planting season because you're supposed to have started them um, by the uh, end of May, beginning of June. That's how slow they grow. And that's, you see, that's the difficulty with them is that's our hot time. You need a cool, shady place to keep them and okay. let them grow slowly. Um, okay, if, like you push, if you push these plants, all you do is make them weak. Okay. It's like, I can, I can walk uh, for two hours, I can only run for five minutes. Um, and you, so you will have uh, more noticeably than any other of your winter brassicas, good years and bad years with Brussels sprouts. You'll see that in our commercial uh, crops with the, in the stores. Some years they're abundant and uh, cheap. Other years they look kind of scraggly and are expensive. That's because that was the year. Now, for plants that you're too late, some of your good garden centers will have starts already growing. Um, places like um, your community gardens that, and your university gardens that have plant sales, um, they often have vegetable starts. And if you can get a, a Brussels sprout, that Brussels sprout plant that's um, about uh, um, as tall as, as your hand, um, or even as tall as your palm, and it looks to have a good stem, not a withered stem, but a good stem, well, that's about the right size for this time of year. And you can have Brussels sprouts. Okay. Um, any other questions you had, uh, Kendra, come in late? Uh, no, that's that was okay. it. So go ahead and check out the chat there. Okay, where did I get the mini greenhouses? Um, I got them in different places over the years. I got one from a big box store or whatnot. Um, if you Google patio greenhouse, you will get um, everything from Dutch lights boxes. You know, those are like the old fashioned boxes with the lid you pull up um, to these miniature greenhouses that are tall. When you look at the miniature greenhouses, look at the size. The ones that I showed you were as tall as me, so that's five and a half feet on the little peak, and they were 12 inches deep and three inches, or three inches, three feet wide. And they came with covers and you could buy though. I actually learned to buy extra covers. I found those covers and the zippers um, lasted me two to three years, but those frames lasted me, I guess my oldest one lasted me about six years. Um, and then I gave them away um, and got new ones. So um, that's with the mini greenhouses. You can Google that. Someone said, I bought mine at Costco.ca and I'm happy with it. Um, thank you, Ruth. Um, I know you got, uh, you sent me a picture of yours and it's uh, a little bit deeper, a little bit larger. It's almost, it reminded me of like, a, um, well, when you don't, uh, don't want to use it as a greenhouse, you take the plastic off, um, uh, you put a, a roof on it and call it a kid's playhouse. Um, so, um, that was, uh, um, that's a slightly larger one. Um, and, um, uh, I hope that it has been successful for you. I knew you were keen about that. Um, can I plant all these vegetables in my greenhouse? Yes. With a caveat, you're going to start these plants in seeding trays or in small pots. I found that I would simply get a gallon pot, put three plants in it. Usually two would come up. I would carefully separate them out and then I would have two plants all ready to go in a gallon pot. My soil was prepared ahead of time so I knew it was rich. And then I would put them in my greenhouse, but the greenhouse was shaded. Um, the one picture you saw of my stunted cabbages in the planter, um, that um, was on the north side of the fence. And so I would move these mini greenhouses depending on um, where I had the most shade. So yes, you can plant everything in your greenhouse, but change the environment of the greenhouse so it's cool. Um, do you harvest leaves of cauliflower and broccoli? You know. Um, I've tried. They're not very tasty. Cauliflower is a flower. It's a head. You harvest the head. 
some types of old variety cauliflower and European cauliflower um, will grow little kind of stalks and stuff that you break off and eat those too. Um, the same on uh, main head broccoli, um, which is correctly called Calabrese. Um, again, you will find in the catalogs, they will have main crop uh, broccoli. They call it broccoli. Um, and then you'll say produces some side heads, um, but you don't eat the leaves. And on the purple sprouting broccoli, you don't eat the leaves. Um, what else have we got here? Um, how much sun do the veggies need in winter? Great question. Um, all, all plants need sun. No sun means slow growth. That doesn't mean no light. That means slower growth, colder growth. Always try to maximize your sun. That's the best way to put it. Um, and uh, you will find a huge difference. For your own garden, you may find that you have a bit of the garden that only gets, uh, or I, I actually had a piece of, of a garden that um, we had that for two months, it literally got no sun, none, that's it, none. Nove uh, November and December, no sun because of the trees behind it. Um, so I had to plant very carefully there, but try it. You know where your sun shadows are. One of the best ways to figure out how much sun you're going to get in winter is it is now July. So we're just past full moon. The um, uh, mnemonic is the full moon in winter is the sun in summer. And the full moon in summer is the sun in winter. So your June moon and your July moon will tell you um, you can see the pattern of shadows in the sky will tell you where the sun is going to be six months later. And you, and you will get a, a sense of where that sun is going to be um, this winter. Uh, you can also go to websites that say, uh, let me, let me think the thing you type in is find my sun window. And you can, and their little calculators and whatnot. Um, and it will show you where you're going to get sun at your latitude. Um, that it's kind of a fun project to do. Um, and if you read Anthony Coleman's books on winter gardening, or not Anthony, um, Elliot Coleman's books on winter gardening, he has some very, very good explanation of the effect of sun, but also the effect of light, um, the, the, the number of lumens you're going to get, which is the intensity. And intensity is important for your more Southern vegetables um, in terms of getting them to set fruit. Um, we all set our tomatoes up. Uh, we begin them in January and February. My sister in Denver, Colorado, waits till the ground unthaws at the middle of May, gets her tomatoes in, and she harvests tomatoes two weeks earlier than I do. That's the intensity of the sun at um, 5,000 feet in the middle of the continent. So if you read Elliot Coleman, you'll really get a grasp of that. He, and if you're interested in greenhouse gardening, you'll really get a grasp of how they went about it because he has a commercial garden in New England. And the most important thing he says is his discovery that his garden was the same latitude as Paris. And Paris and London were the most important urban gardeners um, during the agricultural revolution. They actually grew all their food within the city limits. Read that section. It's a fascinating bit of garden history. They took Mendel um, at his word. Um, now, is there anybody else that wants to ask a question? I don't see any. Did you see that uh, request just to repeat that saying again? How you remember? How you remember oh, that? Oh, repeat about the, the saying. Yes, of course. Yeah. The moon 
the full moon at midnight is the noon sun in six months. That is really interesting. I never knew that. That's really it was cool. a great revelation for me. Yeah. Um, because when do we plan our gardens in winter? Oh, yeah. Well, where is it going to be sunny? <laughs> yeah. And for me, I learned that I was going to have that two months of no sun because we moved in in summer. Oh. And so I learned. And That's it's not just the one night because we have three nights of full moon. So you can usually get a sense of it. And if you can glimpse the moon, even if it's partially cloudy, track it across the sky because the full moon comes up um, in uh, um, just before sunset and it sets just at sunrise. So if you see it coming up and the next morning you see it going down, you know how it's tracked and that gives you a sense of it. It also goes higher and lower along the horizon. Um, but the idea is there. So the full moon at midnight is the sun at noon in six months. That is really interesting. Neat. It's kind of cool. Thank isn't you, it? Joe. Um, yes. So is there right. anything else? Are we done for the day? I think we're good. And we're at 229. That's perfect timing. 